All right, guys. Welcome back to the Highman Podcast. It is episode 16. Currently, it is 12.07pm on the 7th of December, 2022. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, it is me, myself, Kaylock, and Peter, who will be hosting, as usual. Uh, today, we are going to talk about social justice and the social justice movement. Uh, in the past episodes, we've kind of like shit on it a little bit, gave it a bit of crit- criticism without kind of diving into the ins and outs of it what it really means, the good things about it, the bad things about it. So today we thought we'd kind of clear up what we believe about it, uh, hopefully give you an understanding of it. If you guys want to research it more, please do. It's definitely an interesting movement. Um, But yeah, I guess we'll just kind of get straight into it, shall we? Mm -hmm. Yes, guy. Right. So from what I understand, the term social justice was first coined in the late 1700s. The Federalist Papers, which were a series of papers that were basically trying to ratify the constitution of the USA. They uh, termed it, and I think it kind of first was meant to talk about like wealth and wealth distribution, maybe, and kind of helping people get out of poverty or something like that, possibly. Um, so that's where it started. It's definitely evolved into different things and more, I'd say, more radical ideas um, in today's day and age. But underpinning social justice is five principles uh one being human rights the second being access to resources thirdly participation fourthly equity and then finally diversity uh, we're not going to dive into every single one of those right now i think we'll kind of refer back to them throughout the episode but i think we're going to try and talk about the philosophy of social justice and um, the reasoning behind uh the movement the kind of reasoning why we think it might be wrong and good um but yeah anything you want to talk about with the origins of it, of it pete yeah so you mentioned the um the the five key principles there and and we we kind of said before the episodes about equality and equity maybe getting a bit confused um that kind of comes from the difference between uh, equality of outcome and equality of opportunity so equality of opportunity being everyone has an equal starting point and then equality of outcome being everyone has an equal end point. But there is a bit of tension there to be argued over, okay, what is equality of opportunity? Obviously, I feel like everyone would agree, op- the vast majority of people would agree equality of opportunity is a good thing. Um, but what what is equality of opportunity? Does that account for, you know, giving people extra extra help who who need the extra help or is it everyone that's a flat line at the bottom so that's that's an area that that we can discuss more and that's uh that's up for debate because um you know it's not it so it, it can be it could be taken as far as saying if there is any difference in outcome it's from the difference in opportunity um which i don't agree with but but people could take it to the extreme and say that. So it is an important area to talk about. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, well, I think there definitely is some disparities between different groups having access to different avenues in life. But when you talk about equality of opportunity, like you were saying, do you just give everyone the same opportunities or do you take into account the natural like genetic differences people have because some people are going to be seven foot tall and naturally athletic, and they're going to be the best people in the world to play in the NBA. Yeah. But equal opportunity, like initiative, that takes into account natural differences. Are you going to try and like stunt their growth so people that are smaller have the same opportunity as them? Like where does like where does the line get drawn? That's where the blurriness comes in. Like for me, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Inequality. Inequality is a problem but you can't entirely lay it at the feet of uh, an unfair system because inequality is just inherent to existence um and yeah so 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 it's something something to be spoke about but do you want to anything more you want to say about the origins of uh social justice movements um i think i think it's quite interesting but now that I think about it, probably appropriate that it started in America. America has definitely, for the last few hundred years, been at the forefront of like freedom and 
ensuring personal liberty liberty and it's kind of it's interesting to me because like for me the social justice movement is at its most like um most prominent in the u.s not necessarily like we've said earlier that the u.s has the most um social injustice in the world because there's, there's definitely other countries that have problems that we aren't necessarily privy to but the social justice movement is at its strongest force in the u.s and like it seems to like the naked eyes and times that the u.s would have the most problems in the world because of all the like controversy that goes on with social justice warriors and like going against the system with all the protests and all this so i find it funny appropriate but funny that i started in the u.s and now the u.s kind of has like the most problems with it yeah it's it's a bit it's a bit ironic in a way um but yeah it's an interesting point i think something we can talk more about later in the episode that you know just because a country experiences the most the most social justice movements doesn't mean it's the most oppressive country and there's there's a discussion to be had there about um a lot of people taking part in social justice movements simply out of social conformity and it being like a trendy type of thing where there are other parts of the world which genuinely need the where people are generally oppressed much more and but but obviously there's not a lot of social movements in those countries yeah 100 percent. Like one example that comes to mind straight away for me is like the uyghurs in china china is obviously a very authoritarian state and there's no i don't think any sort of social justice movement that could even exist even if they wanted to mm-hmm. uh, it's like the state would just shut it down straight away but so many people in the west are so concerned with the systemic oppression that happens within our own countries yeah possibly down to the media coverage of it that you kind of forget that there are people out there that actually are being like, oppressed and their human rights are being violated not necessarily yeah. their self, but like their human rights are just being fo- fucked yeah so so one of the key key core components of this of social justice movements is human rights and we touched upon this in previous episodes, talking about the different values of like the Eastern versus the Western world, like China versus America, in terms of collectivist versus individual, individualist values. And in that conversation, we touched upon how um, we, uh, one of us heard on a podcast, uh, or maybe we both listened to the podcast, which said in China, they kind of treat it, the the things that we call human rights they actually call like western rights so they don't that the belief is not that these these things are fundamentally like inherent to what all humans deserve but rather it's these values are are western values and not necessarily true mm. yeah it's interesting because they would all they would sacrifice the individual's rights for the greater good of the group which you could argue is a good thing and a bad thing but no, if you want to listen to more about that go check out the episode yeah uh, let me do it okay. um but yeah but one of the difficulties with social justice movement though is like from what i've seen is and what i've heard they one of the principles that's a great principle to underpin it is human rights everyone can agree that human rights like the large majority of them that we've established should be applied to every single human life mm-hmm. the thing with social justice is they are interchangeably use human rights and as um as and they use they use social justice and human rights interchangeably so it kind of makes everyone believe that, that there's a connotation that social justice is the same as human rights where it kind of goes a bit further yeah and they kind of direction at times but by using like this idea that human rights are social justice, it puts like this great pressure on like governments and different organisations to kind of bow down to the social justice movement. movement. Yeah, it's it's like if if you're not um, if you don't use my pronouns, then you're violating my human rights, like that type. Yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah. It's a very difficult thing to talk about because people on the extreme side it's difficult to have a conversation because people on on the extreme left side in this case it 
if you even attempt to have the conversation about it, the fact that you're you're presenting an argument against what they're putting forward is seen as the thing they're criticizing. So they put you into this box and they don't have to actually have a discussion or there's no there's no discussion to be had for them because instantly as someone who would present that argument, you are the problem that they're talking about. So so it makes it difficult. Yeah, and maybe this is one of the one of the fundamental things that's kind of wrong with the movement. Anybody that has an outsider is just shut off and there is no discussion, like you were saying, which just creates creates these echo chambers and it like shutting down the ability to have a conversation and debate about your ideas and beliefs. Like it doesn't make your ideas and beliefs stronger. It just makes them more isolated, which can make them which to an individual can seem like they've grown in strength because nothing's opposing them, but mm-hmm. it just means they've grown in power. It doesn't mean they've grown in like the ability to be right and just. Yeah. It's interesting talking about this. Um about freedom of speech in the context of social justice movements uh, and how that's changed over time because in the past freedom of speech would have been something encouraged by the left and and by the social justice movements they want people to be able to speak um to, to believe what they want to to live their lives how they want to without being oppressed but now it's kind of shifted where freedom of speech has been is more of a right-wing issue now where to where on the left wing it's it, now it's not that everyone should have the freedom to speak it's that if if you if you speak against our, our beliefs then you are the oppressor not that the oppressor is the person who stops people from being able to speak and i think the freedom of speech issue is is quite fundamental yeah like when you use that word oppressor like it made me think that the social justice movement almost believe the oppressor doesn't necessarily deserve as many human rights, for example, the freedom of speech right. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it, it makes me laugh a little bit because it's almost exactly what they're fighting for. Like back in the day in the 60s, the social justice movement would have been described as the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And yeah. The civil rights movement was all about the oppressed people going against the oppressed uh, going against the oppressor and like the oppressor let's say the US government would have thought that the that the black, black people were the oppressors body body so they didn't deserve any human rights mm. whereas obviously they did and it kind of seems like that's kind of flipped now where the social justice movement has become this all powerful thing and they are the oppressor but they ob- observe other people that go against them as the oppressor and take away their human rights and it's like that's exactly what they fought for and still are fighting for yeah the quote the quote by martin luther king you should some something like you should judge people uh not by the color of the skin but by the content of their character yeah you know, this has kind of been reversed all the way where uh, and i'm not saying it's ever everyone's like this but on, on the very extreme left side you if you're white then you don't get to have an opinion on black issues or if you're male you don't get to have an opinion on um on on female issues and and that's you know you're judge you're saying someone can't have an opinion on something because of the way they were born which is the complete opposite of what someone like martin luther king wouldn't what the aim of the movement was for which was for equality to be judged by for the person you are not these superficial things but um but it seems as if some some social justice uh, people have gone gone too far in, in in identifying people as groups. It's it's become I forget I forget I feel like there's a better way to put it. But but basically that that you can just you can put someone into a group and that they either can't speak or or that their opinion doesn't matter or that their opinion isn't their own opinion as an individual they don't get to have an opinion as an individual they're simply a representative a representative of x group a white male group group politics and all that yeah they're not they're not an individual who has opinions and who can think for themselves they're simply a representation of, of this of the group that they're in 
Yeah, it's sort of a bit like intersectionality. Or... Um, I don't, I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. But that, that's one of the, that's a sort of like a big part of the social justice movement. I think it's, I think intersectionality first started from memory. I think it was seventies maybe or eighties, and it's basically this idea that if you intersect between different oppressed groups, you are more so a victim so you have like you need to be looked after more mm-hmm. kind of so for example if you're a female you're oppressed by the patriarchy whereas if you're a black female you're not only oppressed by the patriarchy but you're oppressed by the inherent racist systemic uh, system the inherent systemic racism that goes about goes throughout the country so you you like your intersectionality kind of this is like it's one of the problems of it. It strips away the idea of you being an individual. It's just it categorizes you as the part of the groups that you are in, like you were saying, and like it just stops the it stops the person being able to be free for themselves. They have to be part of this group. They have to go along with what this group's feeling and gets back into like that herd mentality. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um... Yeah. Well, one thing I'll say, I was going to say it earlier, but um, when we were talk- when you were talking about how like it's interesting how in the past the the people that were championing championing in championing is that the word the people that were fighting for freedom of speech would be the left, mm-hmm. and how it's more prominent in the right because the right are getting their freedom of speech taken away by left. Uh, influence like organizations for example twitter mm-hmm. <clears throat> so twitter like in the past it seems that the people the, it seems like the group that's fighting for freedom of speech is a group that is oppressed in terms of their freedom of speech being taken away like in the past it was you had the authoritarian state that was mainly conservative like right wing mm-hmm. and um, the people that are at, at the bottom let's say the left the workers they were the ones championing freedom of speech, and that's kind of, kind of flipped. Um, I don't know why it's flipped, like because we still have freedom of speech, but it's just freedom of speech has only been is it, the only the only issues with freedom of speech being taken away it seems to be on social media, from what I can tell. Yeah, it's, it's. I think it's it seems massively to do with the whole can, cancel culture. That's seems like the fundamental thing for anyone with influence um that their freedom of speech is gets taken away or they get they get deplatformed for talking about certain things and uh, on youtube people get demonetized for talking about certain things um or, or their videos even get taken down but um but yeah i guess it certainly has to do with the rise of social media and, and the use of social media i don't think otherwise but yeah. but at the same time, with social media, the ability for to be for freedom of speech has expanded because now you have access to say something that can be shared um, through the entire world, whereas the only people who had a- access to, like such access to share things was was people in power of newspaper publishers or or in government or something who had the ability to to spread a message. Now now everyone does, but um. But it seems as if there's a big movement. It's a, it's the cancel culture movement where people, you know, we can we can get into the reasons why it exists. But um, but yeah, it's this group mentality. It seems like everyone wants to one up each other, and by by tearing someone else down, it it brings you up. You're showing how morally virtuous virtuous you are in a way. You're virtue signaling by pointing out someone else's flaws. Um, and it's just this very toxic sort of thing that, that comes back around. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things, like, when it comes to the freedom of speech and, like, the cancel culture, there's, like, there's been so many cases of people <clears throat> simply, like, writing a single word, like, vaccine, over, like, especially over the COVID lockdowns, and then they would get demonetized or their page would get taken down. When it comes to freedom of speech, do you think that freedom of speech should extend to like the access to information 
because when it comes like in terms of like Google, for example, they definitely like orchestrate how they feed your search engine. Like when you search things on Google, you don't necessarily get the top result. You get the top yeah. result that they show. So that's not necessarily freedom to the fleet, like freedom of access to information. Yeah, I don't know if that's even right in itself, but do you think freedom of speech should also kind of apply to freedom of information? Yeah, well, it's not to say there isn't an issue with fake news, so to speak, false information. It is, it is an issue. People, it's so easy to spread false information online. But I do think, I do think that is somewhat of an easy out for big tech companies um, like like Twitter or Google. They can, in the name of not spreading false information, they have the power to completely control the information that's spread and, and control the narrative. I am skeptical about about the motives there, and it, as it does often seem with these these platforms that certain agendas are pushed more than others um even you know given i i don't know how how they verify the information so much but it does seem like they do use that power to push a certain narrative not necessarily just to block out fake information um but to your question about does does freedom of speech extend to access to information? Do you have a right to access information? I don't know. It's a tough one. I mean, it, it's it's a value problem because because Google they have all this information. Like, is it is it their moral duty to simply to show you the top result in terms of what's what's been clicked most on the search engine? But, but they get to define what the top result is. Um, do you, so yeah, it's it's a very new problem. We spoke about social media and technology in the last episode, and it's you know it's not been around for very long. So we're in the guinea pig phase of it. Um, but yeah, what do you think about that? How 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 much of a right do we have to access to information, and what 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 should tech companies do to provide that, or or do they have any responsibility to provide that? Yeah. I don't know if they do have any responsibility per se. Um, I think it's difficult to say that one company should try and give you access to all of the information because any any personal organisation that provides information is going to provide it in terms of their bias. Mm -hmm. like everybody has this inherent bias to what they believe. And they're going to tell you things or show you things in a certain way that kind of skews it to how they see it. Yeah. So if you were to say Google needs to kind of do something to counteract that, like how would they do that other than kind of directing you to a competitor's search engine, if that makes sense? Like how would Google formulate their search engine to show you how they don't want to show it other than just saying go to, go to Yahoo or like Firefox or like DuckDuckGo? I think that's where that difficulty comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah obviously. Okay. Perhaps there is. I mean, I don't. The thing is, I don't know if they need to. They need to share their algorithms, for example, that they use on the search engine, so that theoretically they could have whatever they want. But perhaps, perhaps there is some responsibility, and maybe one day there'll be rules in place which enforce a certain amount of uh <clears throat> i think i think there would be a way of stopping certain agendas being pushed it's difficult though because for example people who um like take down false information on twitter if they have their own biases then they're going to scrutinize the false information that is against their beliefs far more than the false information that confirms them um, which presents a problem but um you know i do actually think I, i'm not completely convinced that it's simply unconscious biases at play here i do think there is there is a narrative that they are consciously trying to push um yeah so, yeah. yeah i mean one example would be, um 
there's a, there's a search engine called Brave, which is like Google, but it doesn't filter through anything. It just shows you the result. That's kind of like the top search or the like most relevant. Yeah. And last year, my uh, one of my law modules, we had the chance of uh, doing like a video call with this with this guy who was a US Air Marshal. Mm -hmm. uh, long story short, he was a US Air Marshal, and for years he was saying we need to have an extra security system on the pilot's cabin because there's it's too easy for people to kind of go in there and take over and hijack the plane. Mm -hmm. He was saying all this for year, like years, and then nine eleven happened, and he became like a whistleblower saying like, I've tried to talk to the government or talk to the appropriate authority and no one ever did anything about it and mm -hmm. now, it's, now look what happened <clears throat> but when you try and search him on google i can't remember his name but when you search him on google nothing comes up but then i searched him on brave and like the top result was him and like the case of him um <clears throat> yeah like him and like all these like uh uh, like court ordeals because he's getting sued by like, the airline industry or like certain people are like trying to like, take him down but it's interesting how like google don't let you see certain things mm -hmm. and like, that was a massive thing in terms of like covid and like the, um what's it called ivermectin and all these other things that like could possibly help with covid yeah. cases like help people get better but they just didn't push any of that because they want the vaccine to be the narrative for some reason mm -hmm. So maybe there is like something they could do just to become more transparent. Yeah, I think that certainly is. Um, we could do a whole episode on that kind of access to information and the role social media companies and um, tech companies have to play in that. But we've gone a bit off, a bit, a bit of a tangent there. Yeah, on social right. justice movements. Um, so to carry on, I think you know I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna talk about and the ideas uh, kind of leading on from what we've mentioned in the previous episodes uh, which, which which we have criticized social justice movements for um so so one of those episodes was the Nietzsche episode and he uh, uh, and one of the quotes from him was that people disguise their envy with calls for equality how big of an of a factor do you think this is in contributing to social justice movements people hide their envy with calls for equality is that what yeah. you're saying yeah so something something to that effect yeah um i think it i think it describes it perfectly Maybe not necessarily. Maybe not necessarily like all the time in the sense that people want what you have because they think it's more desirable. Maybe it's because people want the same standard, like quality that most people have. So someone's going to someone deserves to be envious if they're at the bottom, and they're below the poverty line, and they don't have the same human rights as another person. Yeah. And I think that's where the foundations of like social justice came from. And it's a good thing that it came because it's definitely helped a lot of people. Yeah. But it has, in my opinion, evolved to this place where although this, the minimum standards have been met, envy is still there because it's part of human nature. And people are envious of power and like wealth and like where they are in the hierarchy. Mm hmm and I think it does describe it perfectly because everyone wants what everyone doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, like the civil rights movement, like that, that wouldn't really be the case here because that was simply that was asking for equality of opportunity, not to be judged on superficial attributes. But I think you know this largely the the thing this most directly relates to is. Is to do with money and redistribution of money and uh, Marxism and communism, those sort of ideas. And yeah, I I think it's and and I don't think it's it's conscious conscious for people, but I think ideas like um, that that if someone's rich and that means they they've oppressed others to get that money and and, and they don't deserve it ideas like that 
people can see there is maybe some truth to them but when people adopt those ideas as their own it just breeds such cynicism which doesn't allow them to move forward as individuals and i think this is my fundamental problem with social justice movements is that i'm i think i think me and you are very you know we have the, the kind of individualist values of the west so we believe in the human rights of the individual and that individuals have rights and those sort of things but we also believe that um that the individuals have responsibility for their own lives and i think an undesired consequence of social justice movements telling people their life isn't the way they want to want to be because um it's outside their control is actually very it's people claim that to be em empowering but it's the opposite of empowering because you're taking you're taking the accountability and responsibility away from the individual for for the position they're in whereas on the other hand i think despite i'm not saying there's not inequality and unfairness in the world but despite those things the best strategy for the individual is to take individual responsibility to take accountability over the actions and and to have that belief that they can change their own lives because that's empowering it's not empowering telling people they can't the reason they won't be successful is because um the color of their skin it's more yeah. empowering to tell people regardless of any privileges or or lack of privileges that you have you can still be successful if you take the right actions and you take responsibility for your life and i think this is this is a philosophy echoed by certainly jordan peterson uh, we mentioned nietzsche as well this is maybe what he thought and uh, and even kind of stoicism about how you should be indifferent to external circumstances and you should be focused on your own personal actions and i think as individuals that's the best strategy to improve your life yeah, a hundred percent. It seems that like the social justice movement, if you kind of subscribe to that way of thinking, you believe that the power ultimately ends up in the people that oppress you. Whereas what you're trying to say now is the power is with the individual and with that power comes the ability to change your position. But if you but if you believe the power is only with the oppressor, then you have no control over how to get out of this situation you're in. Mm. And that is the problem that kind of a lot of people with this victim mentality like get they get into this idea that they are the victim and like nothing can be done unless some savior comes along takes yeah. the power away from the oppressor gives it to them whereas what you're saying and i completely agree with it is every individual has the power over themselves and with that you can just you can do like unimaginable things to improve your life yeah yeah, I think that responsibility is not incredibly important for people. However, you know, there's this... So there's the idea that, like, one of Jordan Peterson's rules in his book is um, basically, like, sort out your own life before you criticise the world. Set your house in perfect order before you criticise the world. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking how much I agree with this because... I can see the other side of the perspective with, that it would be a virtuous thing to... It, it kind of echoes the hero's journey that we spoke about, like despite being this flawed flawed person, um, you're, not, you're not all that you could be, but you're confronted by injustice in the world to take that burden upon yourself to, to confront that and overcome that, even if you're not not the perfect person that you could be i think there is something courage courageous about that and and it can be a good thing so but but i do think it's very difficult to like can people be because it is a it is a matter of taking responsibility but in in a different kind of way taking responsibility outside of yourself which i do think is a good thing but I think it's difficult when you out it, to see to see injustice in the world as as a problem uh, as a main problem, not the problem being your own self. Um, what do you think about the tension between being able to take responsibility for your own actions and yourself versus 
taking responsibility for the injustice you see in the world? My thoughts on it would be like, as an individual, we are like very lucky to be in a position where we have a lot of power over ourselves and like that power can extend to other people where we can build up our lives in such a way that we have enough resources and power and money to help those around us. <laughs> and I think that that generally, genuinely, generally comes from focusing on yourself and taking authority over your own house and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I think humans, although that is true, I don't think we necessarily as individuals have enough power and the ability to go out and solve other people's problems unless you form a group of individuals that are like-minded and then you can pull together your resources and then that will have a greater impact on the people who are trying to help. Mm. The problem with that is I'm very much afraid of like groups getting big and powerful because I just see them becoming corrupt straight away. Maybe not, sorry, maybe not straight away, but I just see groups and organisations that become so big, they are definitely more privy to corruption and like greed and because of that I would say it's more important for an individual to focus on what they can do for themselves and then in the end I think that would eventually end up helping people around them Mm. maybe not really people as forming a big group and going out into the world uh, and helping loads of people but then they're not risking corruption and echo chambers and becoming biased against other things yeah yeah, there's a there's a few issues with that. The first one may be okay. You think there's a problem in the world, so the first problem would be okay. You you think there's a problem in the world. What what gives you? Are you arrogant to think that you know enough about the world to understand the problems that there are? Are you just misinformed? You know, especially amongst young people who engage in. Uh, who have certain beliefs associated with social social justice movements in the modern times, like you, you probably you might not have had a full time job. You haven't supported a family. You haven't, you don't really know how the world works. You haven't experienced it firsthand how the world works. Yet you think you can, you have the knowledge to restructure society in a better way. So there's an issue of arrogance over how much you know. And then there's also an issue of, okay, given your current position, are, are you also arrogant to think that you'd be able to do anything to fix it? That you're, even if the problem you've identified is right, are you capable of, of solving it given the same things, given that you're perhaps naive about certain things or, or you just haven't developed the abilities yet? So I think there are some dangers people can run into. Um, or do you, on that path do you still think it though even with the lack of knowledge and experience one could argue it's still courageous and right and just for an individual to try and go like go for that and like try and fix the world in these certain different areas because mm. yeah. like we we do learn maybe not the best way overall but we do learn a great from trial and error, like a great deal from trial and error, and getting things wrong teaches us the most. So maybe it will be a tricky path to take, but it's definitely courageous, and like you could argue, it is the right path to take. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's certainly, you know, it comes back to this, this thinking of it as a hero's journey or this inadequate person right now, but you're confronted with a problem, and you take the responsibility upon yourself to solve it. So it can be a virtuous thing, but um. But there are some dangers in it. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking, okay, well, what's the, what can people do to, like, how how do you deal with this? How do you know if what you're doing is right or how do you know whether you're arrogant or not? And I think a massive part of it is telling the truth and and living the truth. Like, uh, and that includes speaking up when you see an injustice in the world. Um right. Yeah, what do you think about that? Okay, is the truth 
like how, what role does the truth have to play for the individual in this mm. i mean the the truth plays a huge role for the individual but there will ultimately be conflicts between different individuals because we all believe in different truths yeah um obviously there are some like population wide held truths like human rights uh, even then, like some of those can be a bit blurry between different groups. But I think you are right when you say it probably is best for everybody to speak up when they see an injustice. Like if everyone speaks up when they see a certain injustice out in public, although there might be disagreements between different people, it seems like ultimately there would become there would be a majority uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Not that you should have to go with your majority opinion but like for example if uh, let's say like a fucking young kid walk past an old man and the old man spills his coffee or something the old kid possibly should go and buy the man a coffee to say sorry if he did it like but then was it an accident or was it on purpose that's where the blurriness comes in yeah. if everyone spoke like that it would give you a more informed opinion mm -hmm. and I think the more informed the more informed you are the better the decision you can make yeah yeah it, it comes back to the thing of okay well if if you're if you're speaking up for what you believe in it is what you believe in correct um so yeah uh and i don't it's not that i don't believe people should take part in social justice movements if they think if, if they've researched a problem and they and they think there's something clearly wrong going on but people should be aware aware of the pitfalls there. Uh, and then the yeah. second thing was like, do you even have the ability to fix it? Um, like, or are you just coming from a position of telling people to act a certain way without really being the person to uphold the values that you preach? Um, and I think this kind of links into where links into, you know getting your own house in order before you criticize the world like perhaps you should focus on sorting yourself out getting a job get, getting some level of achievement having an impact you know putting some work in that has a positive a positive effect on on some people um perhaps perhaps having a family and, and learning you know raising family taking more responsibility and at a certain point of you know, gaining more experience, like you actually be in a position where you can start to have an impact on the wider community. And then obviously that can expand, but perhaps it's something that people should see as, maybe it's this thing they should see as a lifetime of work towards acting out the proper values rather than trying to change the world and, you know, one little act of social justice. Yeah. I mean, if if everyone's so following that rule, sort of set your house in perfect order before you go out and criticize the world. When I first heard that, I thought like, like it was great because if everybody in the world sorted out their house, it seems like me ultimately the benefits of that would trickle down to the wider community and the world. So the world would be set into a more ordered way. But the problem is every single household is gonna be different. And you're going to have, for example, an Islamic household and like a Jewish household and then like a atheist household. If they all set their house in perfect order and then they go out, they probably want to set out other houses similar to them. Yeah. So like there is definitely always going to be a fight between making sure your house is all right and then making sure that the world is also about your house. If that makes sense, then yeah. a better way to work that. I can't really think of it. But it's like if the house, if your house is in perfect order, you want to, you want the world to be in perfect order. But that won't align with what the, the what that your your sense of order won't align with other people's sense of order. So maybe it is right to go out into the world first, try and see how you can improve it, because through that trial and error, you might be influenced by other people, and you come might come to a more you might come to a consensus of how the world should be and then you can sort your house out after that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's kind of a trial and error thing where you, where you test your theory. And I think the problem with a lot of social justice type things is people have these ideas about what what will fix a problem, but they don't actually like thing with the sorting your house, putting your house in perfect order is okay, these people are allowed to sit here and have these theories and beliefs about how the world works and say they know the solution to it when they can't even act out a solution to solve the problems that immediately face them. And, and when you when you focus on your individual problems, there's actually like an action and a response and your beliefs can change. Whereas if you just have these abstract beliefs, that you try and force upon other people that never actually get tested out because the government doesn't change its change to a communist government, for example, if that's what you believe. Yeah. In that situation, you can sit there as long as you want and say, yeah, this is this is right, this is true. Whereas if you have beliefs about things, about the proper way to be, the proper way to act, and then you act it out in your own life, you get feedback on whether it works or not, which forces you to improve um which and you said maybe you should go out and try and see what good you can do in the world to see what impact it has but i think focusing on individual problems actually is what gets you the feedback sooner allows you to to develop um i think yeah but but you mentioned how people will sort out their own house and then try to make other people sort out their houses but i think a different way of framing it is people sort out their own house and they lead by example and over time it should prove that if their way is the proper way then their lives will be good and other people will look at their lives and think uh, yeah and be inspired by the example but you can criticize that and say well if you're just in your own little walled garden with everything sorted then you'll never actually have a wider impact but um gandhi has has a quote um what was it leads be be the change you want to see in the world so you need to you want to act out the values of the person you should be um yeah uh, but it's interesting he he says that because you can argue you can argue what he meant by that but that's what i take from it anyway yeah to lead I mean, by one, example one more thing to say about like setting your house in perfect order uh, I was talking to someone about this months ago, and he said, like, he doesn't like that idea because what happens if the reason that your house is disorganized and is a bit chaotic, the reason that ha has happened is because of the outside world. And he said, like, if your house is not in perfect order, it might be down to the fact that there's something in the external world that is making that happen. He didn't really give me an example for what yeah. that could be, but I think it's like Zizek talks about this. And he says, like, if you're just a worker on minimum wage or whatever, and you have to work so many hours a week just to pay the bills, you might not have, you might not have enough time in the like, week to actually sort your house out and keep it clean. So that, what do you do in that example? Do you not think the minimum wage worker, if they took responsibility for their own life and you know, if they weren't happy with the wage they were making, they worked to build up their resume and apply to another job, a higher paying job. Uh, and, you know, practice and a few skills and just focus on the individual things. Do you not think that would help them solve the problem quicker than try and protesting about increasing minimum wage if that's if that's what they were doing? I agree with you. Um, I agree with you, but I think that only happens when the person in that situation believes what we're saying. But if the person in that situation believes that the reason for that they are struggling is because of this oppressive system, then they're never going to take control. Yeah. Because I don't think they, like, don't think they have the power. Well, which, like, which, yeah. Well, 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 in that case, maybe they're trying to change how the world works. They should change their beliefs and believe in something that empowers them more as an individual that's my take on it anyway um yeah yeah but uh ex extending from this so talk about 
certainly as an individual and i would also argue for why the society taking responsibility for your own life and improving your own life will lead to certainly improvements in your own life and i think through the person you become indirectly it may improve the world but also becoming a person a more competent person who understands the world better you you're in a better position to actively go out and improve the world but i think uh, i was thinking about how how you could criticize this and you could say well there are problems that will never immediately affect you but it's still important that they they are addressed um mm. So if you're simply focusing on your own individual, improving your individual life, then then you might it it might be a justification to completely ignore the problems outside of yourself. Um, how do you yeah. think? How do you think people can avoid that being a problem? Is is that a problem? You think? Do you think? And how how can people? I think it, those might, things? it might not necessarily be a problem if. Okay, so you've got a person who has a problem and they share the same problem that 50% of the population do. If the person focuses on solving their problems and then eventually that kind of leads to the same problem being solved for the rest of that percent of the population, I think then that's a good thing. and You don't necessarily have to work, worry about other people's problems because... It kind of but it's a utilitarian idea. It's kind of like the best outcome for the most amount of people, mm-hmm. because the, most people, the, the the group, the biggest group that's oppressed will have their problem solved if all the individuals in that group try and solve their problem as individuals. Mm-hmm. But then you'll get a sub like a sub portion of the population that does, that shares their problems with only one percent of the like population. Their groups not, maybe not necessarily going to get solved to the same extent, but that, not that that's a good thing. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing on a utilitarian um, belief. Yeah, there are some groups that maybe aren't capable of; they're not in a position to be able to help themselves. Um, yeah, like the bigger the group, the more likely that they are going to be able to solve their problems. Maybe. Yeah. But uh, I still, I still, to be fair, I still believe that focusing on, um, be acting out your values in the world and and focusing on the individual that that will help you become the person that would be able to, to help other people through through competence and obviously if you work on making more money, you'll have more money to help other people. So there are there are other knock-on effects um i heard this i've had someone say i'm i'm gonna paraphrase it or just kind of get the point across but it's like you you can you fill other people's buckets with the water overflowing from your own something like that so only once your bucket is full can you help other people if you're in a position where you own this low place to help people from the low low places the impact you'll be able to have is no nowhere near than if you built yourself up before trying to build other people up. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good quote. I guess though, like, what happens if you're seventy five percent full and this other person's only ten percent full? You giving them fifteen percent would make a huge difference to them. I although you're still losing out what would you say to that i'd say yeah yeah maybe it i i don't know it's uh maybe i don't i don't want to take them at the like saying too literally but you could say in that case okay well you you filled your bucket you've done quite well to fill your bucket up 75 percent. you can't actually help other people without hindering yourself too much uh yeah so maybe, even, maybe go on sorry even- even if you lose that 15%, let's say hypothetically, giving it to someone else, although you've lost that percentage, the fact that you've helped someone else advance makes it more likely that they're going to go further in life so then they'd be able to help you mm-hmm. in the future. So yeah. Like overall, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an element the more, of reciprocity to it. 
yeah 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 that's true um but i guess the thing is for people who are at zero percent like you're not gonna it, you may, you may not be able to help us you, you're not nearly gonna be able to have the impact than if you focused on building yourself up first i think that's mm. that's the main point of it um so we we spoke about in the Nietzsche episode we we criticized it i want to go i want to go back to that i did mention it briefly but to the idea of social conformity so Nietzsche has this idea of the higher man versus we spoke about it more in contact versus the last man but it's also the higher man versus herd um so the higher man would be someone who thinks for themselves who forms their own opinions based on the opinions of well based, not based on other people's opinions but based on their own interpretation of, of the world and facts and they're not simply basing basing what they think of social conformity of of what the popular belief is um whereas the herd is is the opposite they're people who who are socially conformist in in their beliefs and in the way they live how big a role do you think this plays in social people hopping on social justice movements i think it's just a huge huge problem at the moment in the last few years especially like i mean everyone can agree black people deserve the same rights as any other group mm-hmm. like that's just a fucking fact that i think most people agree with unless you're actually a racist blm became this huge movement uh over lockdown especially after the george floyd uh mm-hmm. murder problem is though like Every single fucking motherfucker. I, I wasn't on Instagram at the time, but like, I heard that every single Instagram post was just a black screen just to show support of it. And everyone was like, yes, he's big protest. Like, go on, do this, do that. Mm-hmm. Buying BLM, like, merch and all those other things. And, like, there's protests all, like, all around the world in support of BLM. And it was just like, yeah, black lives do matter. But BLM, the organisation, if people were to actually, like, look into it and talk about it, they would... um understand that it was more of like a communist and like marxist type of belief yeah it wasn't based on the fact that black people should have the same rights as whites it was let's take away power from this structure that is called capitalism and try and give it back to all these other people even though in the end it seems like the blm leaders were all corrupt because they just stole all the money that they got donated to them yeah yeah that's when when i was considering this point that I, I thought of the Black Lives Matter movement as well and how everyone was posting the black squares. And something that some people posted was if you're if you're silent, then you're with the oppressor. And yeah, I had a real true. I had a real problem with this. Um because the uh, the reason people were posting it was because it was it was a trend. Um, not that people really took time not well most of the people who posted wouldn't have taken time to really dive into the problem obviously what happened to George Floyd wasn't right he shouldn't have been he shouldn't have been killed and maybe it was reflective of some problems but uh, to jump from that to to having to support this movement otherwise you're racist and and having to you know support the movement that makes claims about widespread claims about the system that we don't that unless you really look into then you're probably not informed enough to understand for it to be for me to be with the oppressor for not hopping on this movement particularly when there's thousands of other injustices throughout the world and for some reason the one i have to support otherwise i'm with the oppressor is simply the one that everyone's posting about it just seemed to me completely virtue signaling and and um social conformity to do that and you know that's that's a critical stance by me and not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing for people to to be posting that if if they if they've seen the movement they think yeah this seems like a positive thing I'm not I wouldn't say that's that's wrong with them but for me I don't it doesn't really seem right to 
to kind of it it does it just seemed very very virtue signaling it was a trend it was an online trend yeah people like if you if you posted a black square now and said oh if you don't post this then you're with the oppressor or whatever if you're not talking about this then you're with the oppressor you know it it, it just shows that it was a bit of a bit of a trend for a time not to say it's not problems there but but yeah i think yeah. that does demonstrate the point of a lot of this being social conformity and another issue is posting things on social media is an easy way to get social validation for the efforts you've made without really making any actual effort without actually doing anything that makes a difference yeah so much so like superficial when it comes to online um presence but the, what like, like like you saying the one thing that like infuriated me was the saying like silence is racism and it's just like well, how the fuck is me being silent any sort of evidence and proof that i'm racist yeah that how is, was how was me not taking a stance on a complex problem me admitting to be me siding with the people with the oppressors uh, it's a yeah. massive jump and, and i don't think it's i don't think it's right i mean obviously it was a tragedy that shouldn't have like happened like but there were other factors that got like came into it apparently like like was George Floyd under the influence of any other drugs that would have maybe <clears throat> like influenced how long he would have been able to last under the choke? Not saying that that choke should have happened. Um, obviously it shouldn't. But like when it comes to like the, the idea that silence is racism, it made me like confused because all of these people that were supporting the BLM protests and stuff, they were realistically just silent. They weren't kind of trying to critically discuss and debate people about how what's going on in America. Mm-hmm. They were just silently following what the leader said, and it was just like, "How are you going to call someone out for doing exactly what you do?" Yeah, just make it right. yeah, um, yeah, and it's like, uh, like you mentioned about how how the BLM organization was clearly Marxist. They had it like written on their website and stuff that their goal was to abolish the police so to not take a stance supporting such an extreme organized which is linked with such an extreme organization hardly makes you a racist does it no yeah it was funny after like two years or three years they that would have been like a year or two actually like all that two or three of the leaders just got found out having like three different homes all worth millions of dollars yeah yeah they're mass that and this is this is another thing with with social justice movements there are many people with massive financial incentive to to go out and spread spread these spread these messages um so yeah i think that's that's something to look out for as well um yeah any other thoughts anything else you think we should mention uh i think maybe kind of discussed like that when i was researching it, i tried looking at different videos and i tried to get some for the like do sort like support of the social justice movement against the social justice movement yeah and one of that was a ted talk by a guy called Charles L. Robinson, I think his name was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Charles L. Robbins, sorry. Like he was trying to talk about how social justice is something that needs to be championed and not need to try and fight for it. And I was like, oh, okay, this sounds like a pretty decent guy. But then when he was discussing the reasons for why you should believe it, it just seemed like he was just trying to guilt trip, guilt trip the listener. Like he used the, cl- the cases of like, black men getting killed by police as evidence that um, people can't believe in like a post-racial society. And it's just like, I understand why you might think that, but I've, I don't know if this is completely factual, but I've heard Ben Shapiro talk about the actual statistics. And he said that more white men get shot that are unarmed than black people do in America, usually because these white men are like, mentally ill, so they're trying to attack police while unarmed and they get shot and killed. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if you're going to actually use the cases of black men being killed by police 
that you can't leave out all of the statistics and he's yeah. just using these like, ideas to guilt trip people. Yes. And it's, I think it's not an issue with the whole movement. Yeah. Like you mentioned about education as well. That's an issue with education. People say, oh, the education system is racist. But then the statistics are that more black people go to university than white people. In the UK, at least. Anyway. In the UK, that is, yeah. Um, yeah. Chinese are the highest attending. Yeah. I think it's like 72%. Mm-hmm. And then like the or Asian is like 60 ish percent. Yeah. So, so the facts don't really back up certain narratives. But it's yeah. difficult to have a conversation about it. And I do and, think. It, sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, I, I think it. I mean, there certainly are problems that need to be addressed, but but it kind of pollutes the whole the whole solving these problems when it just becomes this socially conformist movement with virtue signaling, and it just uh, makes it very difficult to get on board with it, which is why I struggle too. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely certain things that I'm not oh, that be amazing, like trying to help. Like for example, like disabled kids, they probably have a big challenge trying to find a university that suits them because so many universities around the world are like, well, let's say for example, like Edinburgh, it's going to be pretty fucking difficult for someone in a wheelchair to get around Edinburgh because it's just so heavy and like cobble streets and stuff. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, how far do you take that example? Like, do you try and make sure every single university in the country has uh, wheelchair access? Is that like something that? Is realistically like beneficial in, in terms of like if you had to spend millions of pounds to make sure every single university was wheelchair accessible but only like a thousand people in wheelchairs to go to university a year compared to 400,000 um, of like people that don't have disabilities if you know what I mean mm-hmm. like should we um, spend money on that or should we find a cause that has an effect on more people yeah. I mean, we can have a discussion about that exact, exact problem you bring up, but yeah, and I'd maybe, I may be on the side of saying, yeah, we should do our best to provide equal access for the, for disabled people. Um, yeah. But I guess, I guess the more fundamental question is, are we obligated to take action to, solve absolutely every injustice in the world um even if there's a higher benefit cost there's a higher benefit per cost of doing something else i guess um and it's tough i mean it'd be great if there was no injustice in the world no i don't think anyone wants to argue that but I guess this is getting more into sociological elements of it, but as you know, I personally think about more more kind of individual elements of it. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I have too much of an opinion on that point. I, mean, I haven't thought about it enough. I don't think. Do you have the, like there was a news article last week, and it seems that in California they are. Um, <clears throat> they're putting in this initiative where the descendants of slaves in California could receive 200 grand in reparations. Problem is, though, like, the panel estimates that the state's total payout for reparations would be $570 billion. So the state's got to pay $570 billion nearly to give individuals that are descendants of slaves uh, 200 grand each. And I this is like a tough one for me because it kind of seems obvious that if you were a slave your descendants were going to have a starting point that was worse off than a person that was a slave owner mm. but when it comes into day, today's day and age we're making people who realistically weren't affected by slavery although their descendants were they weren't affected by slavery we're giving them something that needs to be paid for by people that had nothing to do with slavery. Yeah. The people of today's day and age will have to pay this money, even though they weren't guilty of the crimes of slave owners. Mm-hmm. So like, what's your idea on that? 
yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think, you know, obviously, obviously there was injustice in the past. It's it's hard to put a number on whether that should be repaid or not. I, I personally think it don't for the, it it shouldn't for the same reasons that you say that. Let's say I as an individual didn't have anything to do with this slavery, and then him, some other person as an individual, didn't receive, but wasn't part of the slavery. But for some reason, I'm having to pay him for something that happened generations ago. But there is an issue with. For example, like black neighborhoods, like the the residue of segregation, like black neighborhoods not being as nice, um, is still there. And but about this specific issue, I feel like you need to treat it like, okay, how can we improve these communities? How can we improve education? How can you reduce crime rates? These are the issues that need to be addressed, not fucking giving someone a lump sum of two hundred grand for something that happens to their ancestors generations ago yeah yeah i agree i think instead of this a good initiative would be getting this money and trying to create some sort of like rather than it being a handout let it be a hand up get these get this money and invest it in black owned businesses and like help these people create their own wealth and, and their own financial freedom yeah Instead of just giving them money that has to be paid for by someone that's not giving you anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think at this point it's more of a more of like a economic problem and a soci sociological problem rather than like a <clears throat> it's not it's not a problem of race, it's a problem of class and and you should yeah. uh, and for example, okay, so here here's the problem with that. So you have a white person and he's he was born in this house next to this black person and they have both had the exact same upbringing not by their choice they both ended up here they were both born in these house next to each other they've had the same upbringing but despite them being in the same situation the black person gets reparations for slavery because it's put them in a worse situation which happens to be the same situation as this white person, but the white person doesn't get anything, which I think is why it needs to be treated as an economic problem. Because if you treat it as a racial problem, then you are this, you will, you are reward, you are like disproportionately benefiting people out of nothing but race, even if someone in the exact same situation. It, if, if they're a different race and they're not benefiting from it but but the reason you're paying them is to reparations for the situation they've ended up in so do so support them on that not on what happened to their ancestors if if that if the problem is the situation they've ended up in then you should address people who've ended up in that situation it doesn't matter why it seems yeah. like the, the reparation thing is um Again, just trying to conform to the to like the BLM movement and trying to do something that pleases them. But when you actually break down the problem and look at it, it's unfair to reward people like the people in different situations for all sorts of reasons. People have privileges and lack of privileges for all sort of reasons. But you've just decided to choose one possible reason and help all people for that rather than doing a more general treating it in a more general way, which is more fair and will help everybody yeah i mean i'm not too sure who has to pay these reparations if it's just going to become like part of tax but it would be i don't know this is just like a funny thought it'd be like so funny if they made white people like pay it then it'd just be like the most racist thing i've ever heard of yeah i'm nah, sure it would but... come out of tax but even still like the way i've explained it there you can't it's still unfair yeah yeah, that's a it's a blurry line though. Like, but even with these reparations, even if you try and pull together taxes to invest in these communities, actually no. Based on what you were saying, I make, it makes sense. I was going to say if you're trying to have a portion of taxes go towards these communities that are affected by racism in the past, <coughs> that can be disregarded if you're just trying to 
pull together the money to help less economically developed areas. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So that's Which kind of sort of you should guard the race. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Should you run for president, Pete? No, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I, I know how to fix the problems in the world, so. Both in your own house. Yeah. <laughs> Fairly tiny at the moment, but yeah, some work to do, definitely. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Um, I think. I guess like one of the things I saw, I don't really understand too much, but like this guy was saying, when it comes to like the distribution of different things in life, there's going to be people that have more than others. And there's going to be like at the moment, maybe there's less people that are like off color in the government, for example. This guy was saying like, who gets what is also partly determined by the legal and social rules that combined with an individual's choices. So although the individual has the power to kind of choose what they want to do, if they want to go into government or this or that, then they can. But like that, the outcome of what they actually, what the, their outcome is also partly determined by the legal and social rules. And I think that's possibly where the social business movement is trying to like aim their um, their efforts. Because they're trying to change like, well, they're trying to change like systemic racism if the, if that if that does exist and these other things. That they think might exist, mm-hmm. which I think, which I think is one of the like, the great things that it does try and do. But recently, it possibly has just gone overboard. Like, do you think it is a good thing that like, they're trying to change the legal and social like norms that we live by? Um... Or do you think possibly all that can be done in that area has been done? Because there are no laws that systemically go against people. Has everything in that area been done? Uh, is this? Uh, are we talking about this in terms of like the racism problem? Is, is this? Yeah, I'd say that's probably the easiest thing to talk about. Yeah. Because, yeah. So, because... so has all the work been done? Well, you know, another another problem with the BLM thing. And, you know, I'd be open to to be convinced about this, but it's very abstract, the sort of things they, um, the sort of things that they claim that they're like, it's, yeah, there are no laws. There are no laws that are racist. It's, it's, it's illegal to be, I mean, it's not illegal to like say racist things, I don't think, but, but there's no laws that legally allow you to oppress people for the sake of their race. So they say, oh, it's it's systemic racism. It's like implicitly implicit biases and that sort of thing. And it's all very abstract, and I don't really see much evidence for that. So I think, like in terms of laws, like yeah, it's um, like there's not much you can't do anything wrong in terms of laws because the only, like for example, if you were to make laws that there needs to be a certain representation of um different ethnic groups then then you're enforcing equality of outcome but i think i think what we need to focus on is equality of opportunity because there certainly are people in who have less opportunity than others who who have worse schools who live in worse neighborhoods with more crime like you need to treat it as as what it is nowadays because people say oh the racism affected the racism of the past has affected the situation they're in, which has affected their opportunities. So the way you address that is by trying to address the situation they're in, which you wouldn't address any differently if someone's black or white. You look at the situation, you think, okay, we try and you know give give people better opportunities who are in, who are disaffected. But I think it would be a positive thing to move away from it being a race problem in terms of racial inequality. Um, and treating it more as like a class problem, I think is personally, I believe that's that's that would be the proper way of doing it. But um, but yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It seems like realistically, the world is ruled by money, 
and that's what like power comes from and maybe not necessarily happiness comes from but it's definitely where quality of life is influenced most but if you have money you have a better chance of having a good quality of life mm -hmm. so that is like you're saying that's where the solution should lie rather than trying to change people's inherent biases against different ethnic groups because they're racist <clears throat> but that's only a small like portion of the of the society like not many people are actually like that i don't think no but some people yeah. argue everyone's like that unconsciously yeah but i think that well to be fair i, I agree with that on some level because if I, uh is it brett or bert weinstein brett weinstein i think yeah yeah like he's an evolutionary biologist and he says it seems like from the evidence he's looked at it would be natural for everyone to be slightly racist to people that don't look like they're in group. Yeah. Because you had to, you were in a tribal community back in the day. <clears throat> you had to be able to identify with individuals in your in group. And then anybody that was outside of that would have had to be considered an enemy because they were dangerous. So you had to be fearful of them and have these biases against them in order to survive. So it seems like maybe there is like an inherent racism in people, but. I don't think that necessarily comes down to the colour of someone's skin. I think, like you said, it does come down to like wealth and class. Yeah, but it comes down to how you look, not because of the, like the skin colour you have, but maybe because of the way you're dressed more yeah. so. But like if you're dressed like in Burberry and Gucci and like all these expensive clothes, no one's going to be thinking you're a fucking mugger on the street, and they're going to be scared of you. But if you're dressed in like scatty like fucking tracksuits and shit, yeah, you're going to be likely to be assessed as someone that's dangerous because they're people that they're the people that are in less economically advantaged areas so they're going to be more likely to steal yeah um and and it's the thing of okay let's say that is some some inherent bias um that people have does the training for it work i've heard jordan peterson talk about it and i trust him as a source and he and he's like no like if anything the measures they don't have good they don't have good measures of it and even the measures they do use hasn't shown that this training has a positive effect i think he said it, it's may have even shown that the training has a negative effect this like conscious i don't know what they call it like bias retraining but yeah the, but companies adopt it out of uh out of fear yeah uh, and and yeah out Virtue signaling, virtue signaling, and social conformity, and and trying to be PC, and um, yeah, I don't think that's good. No. Um, oh, I was going to say something, but I forgot now. Uh, is that everything yeah. you think? Yeah, I think that is what I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just give some closing thoughts. Like, we've, like, even in this episode, we've criticized it more than we've, we've praised it. But that's not to say that there isn't things that people should do. If there's problems in the world, there's not things people can do to have a positive impact on it. But I think it's important to consider um, whether you're naive and, and arrogant and to think that you know the problems and how to solve them or whether whether you can actually make a difference in what you do and whether your focus on these external problems create a certain cynicism that takes away power from yourself and other people by you promoting certain ideas but um yeah there certainly are things people there are injustices in the world that people should solve and and i think you know, trying to be truthful was a way about that and being courageous with that, um, but not simply just conforming to, to social, to whatever, you know, the trend is, whatever people around you are saying, simply out of social conformity. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a big dichotomy when it comes to it. Like, speak out when you see the injustice, but like, don't speak out as if, as if you know the whole truth. Yeah. And maybe... Like, remember. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Uh, and yeah, just maybe consider the fact that building yourself up first uh, before trying to help the world could be a good idea. That allows you to help the world in a more powerful way. Yeah.
But yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely something that needs to be kept in people's minds because social justice is something that we should try and attain. Like maybe we have evolved so much so that we're so conscious that the basic human rights, although they serve as well, our understanding and like ability to think means we like know the implications of like the wider implications of how we treat each other and this is where social justice is, is coming i think so maybe we're almost too smart for our own good but that's the situation we're in so keep in mind like how you treat people and if that is informed by maybe some biases maybe but i don't know as long as you're treating people right it doesn't really matter yeah as long as you're aiming up yes onwards and upwards shall we wrap yeah, up um, yeah I think that's basically it today um, yeah don't become a social justice warrior warrior just because your mate does please don't become one of those fucking dickheads let's say um, but right then let's finish up it is currently 1.37pm uh, that is it for today thank you for joining us please check us out on uh, Spotify if you want to and listen to it on the go rather than have to watch it on YouTube. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Thank you guys. See you in a bit. See ya.